Tonight, we're actually not going to make something beautiful to bring into the house, but a means to an end. We're going to make a jig, one of my favorite jigs. The one I get asked probably the most about is the tenoning jig on the table saw. A good jig to me is simple, but it's effective and accurate, and it's cheap and easy to make. If it's all that, that's a nice jig. Now, jigs come in a lot of forms. Typically, they're set up for the different, uh, a particular machine that you'll use them with. It could be a standing machine. It could be something for the bandsaw to use on the shaper. Um, there's all kinds of jigs to use on your bench or to use with a router, handheld tool. So the list goes on and on. But one of, there's a, a quite a nice number that you can build for your table saw, and this is really one of the, outside of the crosscut sled, this is probably the number two jig that you'd want for your table saw, if you like making mortise and tenons, which I do in the traditional form. So mortise and tenon, just to refresh, is this classic joint. We've got the tenon here and the mortise into the leg, it's a great interlocking system where you've got all the fibers running this way on the rail and the fibers running this way on the leg and the tenon is just encapsulated into the mortise. You put some glue in there, you have a nice fit like this one. You can see I'm not forcing it. It's not like I'm pounding it in there and I, it's not, it's not going to fall out without glue. That's a good fit. So. Once you get the glue in there, it is not coming apart. So anyway, what I want to show you is the jig that we use in making these. I run through first, I'll cut the cheeks first, and that's what this tenoning jig does. It cuts the cheeks, and with an additional spacer, you can cut the cheeks very rapidly to fit your your uh, mortise. So I want to show you how I make one of my favorite jigs, the tenoning jig right here. And look how dirt simple that is. It's just a box that sits over my fence like this. And it's got a backer block to run through and to cut the cheeks of a tenon. So like for instance this one, we go forward once and then we'd have to make a second pass to get on the other side to cut your tenon to the desired thickness. So, how do we make it? Well, there's a lot of little variations you can use. So what I'm going to show you tonight is the size that I landed on. You could adjust it. You could make it a little shorter. You could make the fence taller. Um, and of course, you're going to be customizing it to your fence. So you'll have to take those measurements into consideration when you build it for that, all right? So to get started, we're going to talk about the box. So let me uh, just show you. It's, I'm going to take the block off. Actually, let me show you the underneath of this first. I'm running through and making the little cuts, and it actually runs through the backer block into this, this large backer block here. And look at all the material that's been cut away from pass after pass. Now, because it's a tenon cutter, you don't have to run all the way through out the other end. You're just going really just beyond the apex of the arc of the blade so you see it get in, buried in there. And that's, that's it. You've cut it and you can retrieve it. So over time, this gets wasted away. But I have found that this block is quite solid and... I can just refresh the backer with a piece of quarter inch, I'll usually use quarter inch uh, MDF, um, not MDF, um, Baltic birch, some nice grade plywood, and it gives you a nice rigid backer. And I tack it in there with a couple brads, and you're good to go again. So once that gets worn out, pop it off and put on a fresh one. All right, so that's the way I like to do this, is have this block like this. And... Uh, there's other ways, rather than having a block, you could have an angle board here set up. You know, you could do it a lot of ways. Now, this one, let me take off 
the block. It's basically, like I said, a box built around the fence. So the block goes on last. So let's take that off so we can kind of get a look at it. I just put a couple screws here and this one I went longer with. They don't have to be that long. But let me set that block aside. And let's look at the box. So it's a simple box and it's uh, the fence, let's get some measurements, is six and a half inches high. You could make it a little high if you want, but I found that's pretty adequate. And I built this out of three quarter inch Baltic birch. You can see those layers. I just like it. It feels this like a, it's a gr better grade plywood. It's pretty flat and the way you assemble it, it's definitely pretty flat and true. So you need a six and a half and this, this one's 22 inches long. The piece of Baltic I had for the jig I'm going to build tonight is just over 21 inches long. So it's really not that critical exactly how long it is. But I have found that I've gotten use out of this jig for things other than cutting tenons. When I take the block off, now I have a box that will ride over my sled. And one of the things I really like using this for is when I'm going to cut an undercut bevel on a panel, like a, I can just tilt my saw blade over. And rather than hold that piece up on edge and run it through at that high angle with the blade, I'll just put it on here and I'll clamp it. I'll clamp the, the narrower piece to this tall fence. And then I can just push the fence through and make that cut. This sled was also really useful when I made that tricky angle cut on the Super Bowl trophy project, if you saw, I took the block off and I had each of the three sides of that um, triangular elongated kicking tee <laughs> were placed up against here. And again, I had the blade laid over at a steep angle and made that cut. So the box is really useful for a number of things. <coughs> so there I've got it six and a half inches high. And then I'm going to need a horizontal piece and this is going to be right about five five inches wide. I'm going to build this one a little bit differently. This one I made kind of quick and dirty and it actually functioned really well. But you can see the plywood comes over and it's just a butt joint against the other piece of plywood. And with the butt joint, I, uh, all I did was pre-drill for some screws and I screwed that in. So I've got these little uh, brads in here and that holds it and then I ran the screws in. So that held up quite well. Now notice in the back what I did for an additional reinforcement was I put these glue blocks in here which keep this upright panel square and true to the table. Okay so I didn't want this to be leaning at all, so putting these in, I made sure these glue blocks had a 90 degree angle and I just glued them on the back. This was a very common use or way of reinforcing uh, two pieces coming together, often in 18th century furniture. Um, you see them all the time underneath uh, old chests of drawers. That's how they attach the bracket feet and sometimes the moldings under there. It's really something I got acquainted with early on in my woodworking journey. <coughs> but uh, anyway, I am, I've got that piece is five wide and that length. And then this upright piece is on this particular one, it's just over two and a half inches. Now this is kind of determined somewhat by the fence on your saw. You want to make sure that this top of the horizontal piece is, is higher than your fence so it doesn't drag on there. What happens is this jig rides on these two rails right here. So they're riding on the actual table when I'm pushing it through. And this is not touching at all. Okay, the horizontal piece is not touching the top. And most of these fences are quite true because you have that steel kind of beam 
and then you have a couple pieces of what are usually their particle board with a kind of from mica like material on top of them and so they're, they're I found that this fence is it's gotten a little weird over the <laughs> over time I mean it's 30 years old but it it's still quite true and whenever I been, build one of these boxes I'm surprised how nicely it fits over the whole thing so without any play at all so you'll find the same if you have this type of fence so that's what we're dealing with so um, what I'm gonna do is instead of just a butt joint with this horizontal piece I'm gonna dado it in and make it a little more accurate to get the height right and it's gonna simplify the assembly a little bit and it's gonna make things more accurate so what I have to first do is get the measurement of the height of my fence and then set the dado cutter so it'll cut a notch in to my new piece. <coughs> so I'm going to set this aside for a minute. We can refer to it if we need it. And I'm going to show you my new material for my new jig. So here I've got a piece of Baltic birch and I was kind of scrambling looking for three quarter. I don't really have a lot on hand, but I had this piece off to the side and I can't remember why I did this, but I veneered it on both sides with a piece of poplar veneer. So that's, this is Baltic birch, but instead of seeing that kind of birch maple skin on there, it's poplar, but it looks, it's nice. It's smooth and it's true. And I've got the same for my other piece here. The vertical piece, I'm using another piece of plywood. It's not great, but it doesn't really matter because it's just going to be the vertical height of the fence I want. So, let me see how wide that is. Okay. What I want to do is measure my fence height. So I'm going to lay something across the fence like this. I've got the here we go. Yeah, I'm right at two and a half, actually. If I check the other side, which you can't see, it's a little more than that. Now, I might want to use this, this fence that I'm going to use on another saw um, that I may be getting that has a higher fence. So it's about, it's just over two and five eighths. So I'm actually going to make it a little over that. It doesn't really matter how high it is, but I'm going to be pretty darn close to this one. So I'm going to set the fence. What I did was I put a dado cutter into the table saw and I went and set that up ahead of time so we wouldn't be messing with that. And I made this little trial cut right here. So you can see that's the depth. It's cutting about 3 sixteenths of an inch deep. The depth isn't super critical. You could go a little deeper or less, but that's all I need. I just want to get a little bit of a, it's more for making it easier to assemble. So I've got in the saw, I've got this, um, this dado set, some of you might ask, from Freud. It's an older one. This, they don't sell them in these boxes anymore, but we put in a link to uh, this dado set. It's a really nice one. If you're interested in it, there is a link there. Um, and I've used almost all the cutters for this because it's, I built it out to the th three quarters of an inch. Thought I might have to shim a little bit, but you know, with that, with that poplar veneer on there, like most plywood is usually a little under three quarters of an inch and Baltic birch is actually in millimeters. So I think it's 15 millimeters. Somebody's going to check me on that, but I think that's true. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, with the veneer, it comes out, it's actually, I didn't need to shim it at all. I'm right at three quarters of an inch with the dado cutter. All right, so let's say I want that to ride on the table. Then I want my slot to be here and I want it to come up two and five eighths. So I'm gonna just set it down like this. And then I wanna measure to this side of the blade two and five eighths. I'll go just a touch over. So here's my vertical piece. This will be my outside. That's nice and true. I like it. 
and we're going to run it through. I'm going to use the gripper to push it through. Here we go. I want to stop here for a second just to show you the cut we've made. So we've made this one, and that's our height. That's going to get us up above the fence. You can see. We want to be up above the top. Now I want to cut the other side, the other support side. Now this is going to be just a butt joint. This is going to sit right underneath this piece. Okay? So I don't need to date all this one. So I want this piece to be the exact same height as I just cut the dado. So all I have to do is keep the fence where it is and raise the blade and I'm just going to skim and trim this off because it's very close. It's just a little over two and five eighths now. So I can use the dado cutter actually almost like a saw blade in this case and I'll run it through and it will get me this piece as exactly as wide as the height I am of my dado here. So here we go. All right, so let's head back over to the bench for a minute and we'll get this put together and we'll come back to the saw. All right, so let's uh, come back to our project here. Here's my upright, this is the lower side, and here's my horizontal piece. Now this is gonna go right in here. I hope it goes right in there. Yeah, fits in nice. That fits in great, no play at all. And that, that's awesome. So now, when I assemble this, I want to make sure that this is, if this is square, if this is a good 90 right here, this is going to be above the fence. If when I lock this in, I'm at 90, and then I put my support piece over here, which is exactly the same height as this piece is here, I should be good I should be very close to 90 here. Now, I want to be 90 degrees to the table here. I want that to be dead vertical when it's on my crosscut sled. Now, if by chance it's not, it's not a big deal because you can always shim the bottom edge of either side to get it more correctly set up. You can also shim your fence to turn your fence a little bit depending on how it comes out. So there's ways around it if it's not dead square, but we're going to do everything we can right now to ensure that we make a nice square jig. I'm going to make a little line on the other side. I'm going to just shoot some brads through here. So before I get started, I'm going to make a pencil line. Let me turn it this way. So you can see the, this is right about the middle. I can see down here, I'm coming right up. Just gonna make a light pencil line here so I don't have to guess. And that's the center of that piece. We'll go ahead and get some, uh, I'm gonna set up my brad nailer. I've got one and a quarter inch brads in this 18 gauge nail gun, which I love. And a lot of you have asked me about these two. We did put a link to this Grex gun. It's a nice, nice 18 gauge gun. Um, now I'm going to put a little glue in here. Because 
don't want it to ever come apart here. So I'll just put a little. All right, so I've got some glue in the bottom there. I've got my square ready. And let's see, I've got, this is the side I sanded a little bit to make sure it would fit. So I'm going to put that right in there. That fits nice. And check that again. Now, I am going to put some glue blocks in here, but which you'll be able to adjust it a little bit. So, but I want to nail it as close to true as I can. That's not very true. The board, not what I just said. There we go. Okay, that looks good. All right, so turn it over. Go ahead and get one in down here. I just want to make, I'm just making sure with this that I'm fully seated so that I don't end up with a bow in this piece. I know that edge was true and straight, so if I'm bottomed out, I'm going to have a nice straight edge, which I want to make sure all my tenons are true. So that's good. I'm going to run a few more. I always think of Norm when I fire the old gun. And we're going to go here. Let's see if we're still square. Hope so. Oh yeah, looking pretty close. It'll flex a little bit if it's not. That seems good. I'm going to just move this one a little. Pretty confident that a, that's bottomed out. <laughs> I'm just putting light pressure with those clamps. I'm not killing it. All right, that looks good. So take this apart. Beautiful. Okay, so that's my position. Now I want to make sure that this is square right here. Man, it looks pretty good already. Really good. But I'm going to put some, I'm going to put the blocks in there just to reinforce it. And plus I can see better. I can really see from this side. It's darker on this side. Now I can see that, man, that looks really good. I'm pleased with that. So I'm feeling... I really want to make sure it's dead square right here. That looks awesome. So I'm going to get some glue block material here. And what I did was I took a piece of cherry, one inch, just ripped it square, and then I jointed two, made a corner that was 90 degrees. So let's double check that. Get it up to the light. That looks awesome. So we've got a good 90 degree corner here. And then when I had that square piece, I just tilted the saw blade over to 45 degrees and I ripped it. So I created that chamfer. This is the way we made a lot of our glue blocks for underneath uh, pieces. And often it was poplar or even white pine and they were quickly done. In the old days, they would use hide glue, like hot hide glue, and just get a little on there and they'd do a rub fit and just hold it pressure until it just cooled enough they could let it go and it was a great strong kind of reinforcement. So I'm going to just lop these off now. I got the bandsaw set up to about four inches long here so I'm going to go cut up three of those. There we go. I gotta make sure I put them on the right side. <laughs> it would not work well if you put them on the wrong side. But look at that, that feels really nice and square, good and true. And it just gives you that 
reassurance that this is going to be a solid, true jig for a long time. So I'm going to go ahead and put a little glue on there. I've got a question while you're gluing. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Is a 6-inch height enough to clamp a 20-inch panel vertically for a quality raised panel cut? I've got, this is six and a half inches high. Um, you might want to go a little higher if that's your main purpose with it. You can always go up to like eight. I mean, eight's plenty. Um, I'm trying to think why you wouldn't want to go higher, but yeah, I would just kind of feel that out. I would probably go a little higher if that was my main thing I was trying to do. So see, I did the rub fit like the old school, is there, is but, but there this, is not, this is not curing right off, so I'm going to tack it, and the brad's actually a holding it like clamps until the glue dries. Go ahead. Madison's asking if there's a reason to cut the chamfer on the glue blocks. Oh, just so I have a good flat nailing side. That, who asked that? Madison. Oh, good question. Um, yeah, Madison, I do that because I... It's kind of a throwback to his history, like that's the way they always were. But it also, if you were, if you're going to clamp those down, if you have a hard corner, it's harder to get the clamp on with a stable edge. And in this case, I want to nail it so it gives me a good flat surface. And it's just a little nicer on the jig over time to have a softer corner there. So it's, it's really not only um, for those reasons doesn't change the effectiveness of the block. So. And is there uh, a benefit to not using, excuse me, to using a single, little single ones rather than a long piece of blue block? Um, you could use a long piece, but when you use a long piece, you're going to be rub fitting and trying to get it true over a long stretch, which is more hard, is more difficult to manage and pressure in. So usually they're smaller and shorter, and you can see how I'm able to control this and really get it in there. And then I still have flat spots I can double check. So I just prefer using the shorter ones in this case. And they work, it, you don't really need a long one to do what we're trying to achieve with them. I mean, this is so good. I can almost feel the suction of it. I almost don't have to brad nail it, but I want to use this jig right away, so just get that on there like that. A little bit more. See, I'm not putting too much. I'm getting just a little squeeze out the top. I'm eyeballing this. This one will be right about the middle. That feels good. That's it. All right, so there we go. We've got a nice right angle in here. This jig already feels substantial and true. Now, the last piece is that support piece, and that we're going to fit on there at the table saw because we're actually going to put a little pressure so it squeezes against the fence, and we're just going to nail down through. Um, in this case, I might, it's just a butt joint, and normally you'd put some glue on there, but uh, I have to use this on another fence that's going to be a little different width. So I want to be able to pull that off, I'll clean those off, and I'll just adjust that fence on my potentially new saw. So, all right, so there we go. We've got that fit. Now, I want to just show you the block before we go back to the saw. I already prepped this. I didn't. I knew we wouldn't have time to do all this, but that backer block that I used. It's just a large chunk of material. I like a lighter wood there because it is a large block. It, you want something a little lighter. That one is. Oh, here. No, I got it still over there. That's cedar, so it was really light. I just happen to have a chunk of that around. Um, it measures. The one I'm using measures uh, three and five eighths wide, and the height is six and a quarter. And this is really just like a nice backer for when it's attached to the jig. 
you want a good solid backer that's 90 degrees to the table. So see this square? This is the way I actually have it. So I know I'm square there. Um, what I did was for this one, I didn't have a chunk, but I had some basswood, and basswood's a good, light, nice textured, easy to work material. You could use white pine would be great too. Um, but I glued it up. I just ripped a couple pieces off of this. This is just a rough sawn piece. I ripped it up, and then I glued up three pieces and trimmed it to that thickness. And the length is just over seven. It's like seven three-eighths. Now, the tricky part is, once you got it glued up, is to square it up. So I jointed an edge in a corner, and <coughs> you got to be really careful with shorter material. So... Um, on the joiner, so just be follow the best practices for that. So look at, I mean, that is just dead square. That's a really nice corner. And then we want to make sure that this is dead square here so that whatever I'm supporting, and I know that's true. Now, when I first cross cut it, I had to cross cut this on my sled and I could only go partial way and then the other side and it wasn't perfect over here. So I just cleaned that surface so it was flat and square this way. And then but I wasn't true here. It was it was going downward there. So rather than trying to plane the end grain, I planed this grain over here. I took away some there so that it brought my square up and it brought it right in true, okay? Always easier when you have the option to hand plane side grain than end grain. Uh, but you can, this is basswood with a sharp low angle plane. It does plane like a dream, but still it's preferred this way. So I have got the square block. We're gonna attach that over there, right around there and I'm going to change it out a little bit because it's too big and I'll show you over there when we get there. I'm going to make it actually like my other one, so like this one. So I'm going to notch this block like this. This is a new backer piece for my other one, so this will actually show me. So by taking out some of that material, it gives, it's easier to handle and I can get my hand closer when I'm holding it, actually using it. So that's why I'm going to remove this quadrant right here. We'll do that right after we change out the dado blade. So here we go, back over to the saw. We're going to take this dado cutter out. And get back the old blade. That is a good... You can feel the weight of that, why it doesn't slow down very fast. Okay, get back the old. Carbide, ridge carbide blade. Okay, so now we're back to normal and we're gonna get our box assembled. So, I'll drop this down for now and I want to get right on this the metal table so you can see um, I'm on the table there now here's my other piece that I ripped exactly the same height as just below the dado so this is just exactly the same it's flush right there and so I'm gonna just set this on this side to support my sled so there it is now I want to just hold a little pressure while I nail this in. So in order to do that, I'm just going to lightly put a couple clamps on there. I'm going to just get this clamp in here. Just light, light pressure. Because I don't want to over snug it. Okay. And over here as well. Just so I'm getting it against the fence there. All right, let's even see if it slides. Okay, it does. <laughs> so that's all you want to do is just squeeze it on there. I have done it by hand before, but you want it to be just nice and flat 
around the box of your fence. Everything's on the table. It's nicely pressed down. Let me get an eyeball here. This is the middle of my vertical right here. I can, I'm right over the middle of it here. I'm just going to go down with a line. That shows me where I want to shoot the nails. That's it. I'll start down here. Just going to put them every few inches. I nailed it to the fence. And there it is. Look at that. Nice. No play at all, but a nice, easily sliding fence. Now let's check it for square. I know my sled, my table saw is notoriously weird, but look at that. That's how easy it is. We made a nice little box to fit beautifully over our fence. And now we're going to put our block on there. So let's raise this blade. I'm going to rip that notch out. I'm just going to go like that. All right. I'm going to just go here and then we'll flip around the fence and I will notch the other side. Let's see. I'm just going to go to inch and seven eighths and I'll have to raise the blade a little bit. But I'm not going to turn off the saw so we can get it done. All right. Okay, let that come to stop before we go after that piece. Now we can bring in our fence. And I'm going to position it right at the back like that. So I'm going to locate where I want a couple screws that hold this on. And put one right about here and one right about here. I'm just going to put two screws. Now I'm going to pre-drill for those. I've got the drills all set up. I'm going to countersink. And I'm going to drill for the shank here with this bit. I'm just using it drywall screws, inch and five eighths. Okay. And now we'll run in the screws. So I'm rather than just hand pressure this, I'm going to put it in position and I can use one of these Clamps. That's good. I'm going to check this for square. I want to make sure. So there we go. Ready to run the screws in. All right, so look at that. This is ready to use. Isn't that a thing of beauty? Never cut a thing yet. But let's get the old one. There we are. So this is my little 
5 16 spacer jig. I think it's set up for this. That mortise is an inch deep. I'm just going to go like 5 eighths here. And let's get this piece here. I'm going to get this out of the way. And so this is the spacer for a 5 16 inch tenon. It'll give me the exact spacing for the mortise. Now, usually I would test it, which I have not, <laughs> and make sure it fits before I would run all double check, you know. So I'll, I'm just going to run one side here, with, and then I'll take it out and run the second, and that should give me the cheek spacing for a 5 16 mortise. All right, let's give it a shot. There we have it. I'm just going to lop those off at the bandsaw and see if we can get a semblance of a fit. Okay, so I know that I'm going to have to notch it up about, I'm going to overdo it a little bit here. I'm just going to cut this off over here. Okay, so normally I'd make those cross cuts on the table saw, but I just want to check the cheek thickness, and that fits in there sweet. That's nice, huh? So there we have it, a beautiful, true tenon on our new setup. Now the last thing I should have mentioned was while I was using it here, you notice my hand placement on top, and then this hand was holding pressure right about mid-height here. And all I'm doing is keeping pressure against the fence. It's solidly against the backer, which is 90 degrees. So it holds it really nicely. And I just come right straight back after approximately the apex of the blade gets over the top. Now, as I was holding it here, I can still feel sharp corners. So I'm going to take, I would even take a rasp or some hard sanding to this block so it's softer and rounder here it gives you a good handhold position and control of the jig as you run it through all right well thank you all so much once again for being part of this and for hanging out with me a little tonight i hope you enjoyed that that's that's a high value jig that i hope you'll build it and enjoy it for many years to come